So welcome everyone to the ARC New York 72nd annual meeting. Um, today, we will uh, start this off with our fundraising pre and post COVID with Preston Evans. And I just wanna remind everyone again that we um, have everybody on mute and um, we will also take questions at the end through the chat box or using the um, raise hand feature. So I am going to turn it over to Eric Geiser, the CEO of the ARC New York. Thanks, Bridget. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for attending the first session in our 2021 annual meeting. This is a series of uh, educational seminars and meetings that's gonna last right through the end of the week. And I hope you'll be uh, able to attend as many as possible. And I have the distinct privilege uh, and honor of introducing our first uh, speaker today for our educational session. Uh, Preston Evans uh, is the Vice President of, I wanna make sure I get this right, Development and Donor Relations uh, with our Achieve uh, chapter. And uh, Preston, I'll turn it over to you and, and thank you for agreeing to participate in the event. Absolutely, thank you, Eric. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Preston Evans. I, as Eric said, I am the Vice President of Development and Donor Relations at Achieve, the Broom Shenango Tioga chapter. Uh, down here in the southern tier, just across the border from uh, Pennsylvania, hop, skip, and a jump away. Uh, so today, I'm going to be presenting well, alongside my, our Director of uh, Community Engagement, Sherry Caudell, um, on fundraising pre and post COVID, measuring success. It's really a little bit more broad strategies that we have found that you know, really like what we've learned, what we what has worked, what has been you know successful because fun the fundraising world changed when COVID hit our community. And I'm sure it was the same for all of you, um, but we tried to keep this a little bit more broad because we recognize that the needs of you know, our community and the needs of yours and are a little bit more, they, 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 they vary. Um, so this is again, strictly centered around some of the events that we do. Um, we have four signature events that we'll go over. Um, it doesn't include other fundraising efforts like our annual appeal, things like that. Uh, that's a conversation for another day. So as I said, my name is Preston Evans. I am the Vice President of Development and Donor Relations at Achieve. I've been with Achieve for a little over three years now. Um, prior to that, my uh, role, I had a, my background was in government. I worked uh, for a nonprofit that was sponsored by our state senator, uh, Fred Akshar, and prior to that, um, Tom Libis. And with me today, as I had mentioned, is Sherry Caudell, our Director of Community Engagement. Sherry, are you here? She might just need to unmute. Yeah, Sherry, you're muted. <laughs> well, that would be helpful if I unmuted. Um, Sherry Cadell, I've been with the Chief for 10 years, where I started as a part-time DSP after being a stay-at-home mom for a few years. Um, and I've had a variety of experiences here over the years. And in, in 2018, I started this position. And so one of the things that, um, that we think that kind of helped us is Sherry started just, I think about two months in her role as uh, in the, our development office, about two months before I did. So we were a very new team. Um, and that was a little bit, it could have been seen as a little bit intimidating, but what we actually found was that it really gave us the freedom to be creative, um, to really kind of make things our own. And that means that we were able to like, we really tried to come up with new ideas and try new things and bounce things off of each other and encourage that that sense of creativity to really like just really help drive that, that our fundraisers and help make them you know make them our own um that we didn't you know we're the foundations were all in place but there are elements and things that you can do that make things very different so fundraising pre-covid so right now i'm going to highlight our four key our four primary fundraisers um so april 2019 we held our 24th annual bob warner pin crushing classic this is our annual bowl, bowling tournament. Um, Bob Warner was an, a former assemblyman. Um, he helped start this tournament. And once he retired, he, he continued on as the host and the MC of this, uh, this tournament that we hold every spring. Um, it ended up being co-hosted by uh, Assemblyman Cliff Crouch, who's pictured there. And um, Assemblyman Chris Friend also signed on board a couple years ago. Um, and when Assemblyman Cliff Crouch retired last year, we actually now have the support of Assemblyman Joe Angelina. So Assemblyman Cliff Crouch now co-hosts this event alongside Bob Warner. Um, it's a, it's a, a, our, as I said, it's a bowling tournament. We, it's attended by about 200 people. About half of those are those we support. 
Um, it's it's a really we have uh, other elements included. There's um, there's raffles. Um, we get a grill donated from uh, a local gas company. Um, but and all, all of our individuals, this comes back into play later. But all of the individuals we support, they all get medals, which are, is seen there. There's a presentation ceremony, but it's it's a, a really fun event. Um, and we, so, like I said, about half of that, those 200 are those we support, and the other half are our community members. Then our next event is in June 2019. This would have been our 65th annual dinner dance. Um, my slides membership meeting and award ceremony. I, the Zoom stuff is blocking part of my slideshow. Uh, this, oh, the Bob Warner Pin Crushin Classic is sponsored by Visions Federal Credit Union. Our dinner dance is sponsored by our Foundation Board of Directors. Uh, they actually came on board as the presenting sponsor um, when another one bounced, uh, backed out a couple years ago, and they found this as a great opportunity to kind of get their name out there. Um, so they've been supportive of this event for the last couple of years. Um, but as it says, this is our dinner dance, our membership meeting, and our award ceremony. So actually in that picture there is our CEO, Amy Howard, and this was a changing of our board presidents. Ellen Feldman is in that picture. She's on our board of governor on the board of governors. Um, this event is attended by about 350 people. Uh, it's as it all kind of implies. There's the there's our dinner. There's a, a meeting, our membership meeting, where you know, we elect new board members and you know recognize those that are kind of cycling off the board. Um, but my favorite part of this event is the the, the and we we have the award ceremony as well. So there are we recognize about 12 staff and individuals across our organization every year for just commensurate work, work that they've done that's just been outstanding. Um, and this, these include like awards videos. Um, we recognize a community supporter. Uh, that year it was um, our head of our guardianship committee, um, Jim Hayes. Uh, and then the end of the night comes and that's my favorite part. And it's because there's just been, it's been about three hours, the anticipation has been building and the DJ hits the music and there's just this rush to the dance floor of everybody just finally being able to dance. And it's just a lot of fun. And that, as I mentioned, is sponsored by our foundation. Our third fundraiser is our biggest fundraiser. It is uh, presented by m and Bank and has been for about seven years. Uh, it, this happens in August, 2019. This, in that year, it was our 10th annual Savor the Summer. This is our wine tasting and um, craft beer uh, tasting event. Um, we get about 40, we get over 40 vendors to this. So we get 40 local restaurants, breweries, and wineries to come out and table at this. Uh, we get about 400 people to this event. It's, it's held at our Cutler Pond facility, which has this beautiful view that overlooks the pond. Um, we cap the night off with fireworks uh, that you know, maybe make a little bit of the neighbors a little cranky, but it, it's a really, really great event. It started as a friend raiser, um, and it's just really expanded into this much bigger thing. Um, my wife does development for our local children's museum. And this year, when they saw the commercials in 2019, they actually came to her and were like, do they really get that many vendors? Because they do a very similar event. And she was like, yeah, they do. They get that many vendors. Um, so this is our biggest one. It's, it's definitely like, it's, it's definitely the biggest one in our community. Um, and it's, it's just a really, really great event. And it gives a lot of opportunity for networking as well. And then our fourth event, and just some background on this, this was our first year of our Overachievers Half K Classic. We held this in September. And just as a little bit of background, um, prior to this, for the two years, we had been the charity of choice for our AHL hockey affiliate. And um, they had asked when we put on a golf tournament. Um, and I had actually started a week before the second year. And they went with a different charity for right after, or for 2019. And we had kind of been charged with, you know, we unified with Shenango ARC in 2017. And we've been charged with kind of helping drive that sense of unity by hosting a fundraiser up that way. And when we lost the golf tournament, rather than, you know, being kind of salty about it, we said, well, this is great. This gives us resources. This gives us the time and the energy to, you know, really do a full fundraiser in Shenango County. And we came up with this idea of doing a half K. So it's 0.6 miles. Uh, it's about three blocks um, up in Norwich, New York, uh, which is also home to the Northeast Classic Car Museum, which is this little gem that I'm not even a classic car person or a car person in general, um, but this museum's awesome. And um, so what we came up with is we were able to figure out a way that we could get from downtown Norwich, 0.6 miles, again, three, walk, three blocks, and ended at the Classic Car Museum with a lunch reception, live music, um, but we treated the entire thing like a full 5K. So you got a, a 
t-shirt, you got a bib, a racing bib, you got a sticker, um, you got, if you were of age, you got a beverage coupon. Um, you know, lunch was included and entry to the museum was also included in that. And we had a silent auction there. The first year we did not have a presenting sponsor for this, um, primarily just because of timing. Uh, we had approached Chobani, who are located in Norwich. Um, and at around that same time, they had switched their philanthropic efforts to be more centered around food security. Um, so they found another way to support us there. Um, but we, it, it ended up being, we had a classic car element. We had about a dozen people, uh, local community members who showed up with classic cars. So you could ride from start to the finish if you wanted to. Uh, the route went right by one of our IRAs up there. Um, so we had all of our staff and individuals out front giving out donuts and cider. Um, it just ended up for being a first year, we had about 75 people show up for it. It ended up just going really, really well. Um, and we had so many ideas for 2020. Anything I'm missing, Sherry, on any of those events? No, you're doing good. <laughs> so for 2019, this is what kind of our fundraising looked like. Um, so we had our goal of about, um, you know, the 79,000. Um, we ended up net revenueing a little over 8,000 over all of those. So um, the bowling tournament was, we got close. Um, and those, so those are just kind of the numbers. So $8,000 was what we ended up being over goal in 2019. I'll turn it over to Sherry now to talk. This was really her brainchild. This is, and this has been a wildly successful endeavor that we have done with our fundraising. Thank you, Preston. So yeah, in as Preston mentioned in 2018, I started actually in July, right before the Savor the, the Savor the Summer was full force and full swing being planned at that stage. And then Preston came on and we found ourselves trying to secure sponsorships for this half K or for the bowling tournament or the golf tournament that year. And, you know, we had a lot of no's because it was late in the year and everybody had already spent all their donor dollars for the year. So after that wound down, you know, I wanted to find a way to incentivize our sponsors to sponsor all four of our events. And that's kind of how Platinum Partners was born. Um, <clears throat> This gives special recognition to anybody who supports all four of our events at any fiscal level. Um, and that is recognition above and beyond what they would have as a regular sponsor. Um, so as you see the graphic there, that's a big board sign that we would display at our on the Color Pond location year round. It would be at all of our events. Anytime we had any kind of community engagement out in the community would bring that along. Um, they would also get a special day on social media where they're recognized solely as a platinum partner. Um, we call them family. They're a platinum partner family. Um, they are also featured in our monthly newsletter and on all our event pages. And then at the end of the year, they get a certificate of appreciation. We want to make sure they feel like they're family. Um, the benefits were on both ends, right? Because we would only ask our sponsors for one targeted ask per year. They're not gonna, we're not gonna be picking up the phone and calling you four times a year. It's gonna save you time. Um, you wanna, wanna make sure you get them before their budget starts. So that is also helpful. You don't, you wanna, we usually after our October event, we will start soliciting for next year. Um, and it kind of levels the playing fields for everybody. In other words, um, one of our sponsors there is Upfront Auto Clinic, and they get on the big board with the big dogs like Visions or Marabito. So that's another great benefit for them. Um, and what I had hoped for was it would equate into um, having them bring in more donor dollars and rather than spreading out what they'd already had. And that actually was the case of 15 out of our 16. So as you see that first year, we had 16 platinum partners in 2019. In 2020, we actually doubled that to 32. Um, we didn't lose a single platinum partner. They all felt valued and you know their marketing dollars felt they felt were well spent with us. Um, and, and during COVID, we didn't lose any of them, which was really amazing. Um, we bumped it up a little bit, between 2020 and 2021, it's kind of hard to, um, it's hard to solicit a lot of new ones, but everybody stuck around and we did get some new ones as well. Um, and one of the ways, I'm sorry, I'm getting a message here, it's blocking me. 
Um, <clears throat> so but the way we would solicit them is they're presented with a menu for all four events. And we're gonna show you what that looks like. So on the left-hand side is kind of the menu. This is, would be for our basic package. Um, so if they come in at the minimum level for our, all four events, it's $1,000 for the year. We would personalize this with their own logo. Um, and then we would, this is the basic plan, but we would always look, you wanna do your research, you know, look at what they've donated in the past. What is their donor capability? What is their engagement with you? All those factors go in and we wanna make it easy, as easy as them for, as possible. So we kind of come in with a custom plan for everybody where we think they'll feel comfortable at. Um, and then they can either, a lot of them, most of them go with what we suggest, but if they want to look at the levels, they can alter it and customize it themselves any way they want. Uh, it's been wildly successful and we really find that this is what's, we've already made goal for our half K because we solicited all these in the beginning of the year for all four events. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Preston. And two things that I would just want to add is as we got uh, got sponsors for the different levels, we started adding them to these menus that you see. So we have two others for the others, but you wouldn't be able to really make anything out if I used the full picture. Um, but we add the sponsored logos because that shows buy-in. It starts to show when we go to the next person, they can say, hey, look who's at this you know thousand dollar level, and they can go, well, I could we could probably support at that level as well. Um, so we it helps kind of drive that that idea of you know, oh hey. This is how they're supporting. We can support that way too. And the other thing that I, I don't want to like risk the presentation collapsing on me, um, but one other thing I wanted to highlight is our one of our 16, our first year was our board of directors. And we didn't even solicit them. We I just explained the the, the platinum partnership at our, our board meeting and we had, and they just voted right on the spot to, to do it. And then what they had decided is they would just split the cost amongst themselves. So in, ter in addition to that, many of them, what they do is they mail me, they were for their annual appeal. They just say they denote, you know, and they've been a sponsor every year since. Um, and we really appreciate that support. But on top of that, then we have, I believe this year we're up to seven members of our board who individually their families signed on as platinum partners. So it's been, it's been really successful. And we, we work with all of our sponsors to figure out the best ways to do this. We don't just like cut, say, cut us a check for a thousand dollars. We have, you know, one of our board members just says bill me per event. It's just whatever works with them. And that's what we always try to emphasize is we will work with you. Let's get you in the door as a platinum partner. So fundraising in 2020, it's not like anything really, really exciting happened in 2020 to disrupt fundraising, right? Um, so we had our Bob Warner Penny Crushing Classic. We were out soliciting, we were doing everything. And then COVID hit and we were monitoring it. We were monitoring it and we ended up about two weeks before uh, before shutdown, canceling it. And so we have again su uh, successfully procured Visions Federal Credit Union as our presenting sponsor. Um, we were able to transfer all of our sponsors to Savor the Summer. We figured, okay, this event is far enough out that we'll have this under control, we'll get this taken care of, um, and we'll be able to be resume that. And that that's a good event to like, you know, roll these, these dollars into. Um, except for Visions Federal, we, we approached them and said, would you be interested in co-presenting our virtual, our dinner dance? And they were on board with that. And our foundation board was happy to have them co-present that event. So we canceled the bowling tournament. Um, and then we kept watching COVID and we kept being shut down. And it became clear pretty quickly that we weren't gonna be able to have an in-person uh, awards dance, awards and membership meeting and dinner dance. And so it, we ended up having to do a virtual awards dance and awards and dance off or dance a thought. So this was on June 19th. Um, I want to just to emphasize because of the uncertainty of finances and everything at that time, you know, we didn't know what was happening with regards to New York State. Were they going to cut rates? Were they going to, we, our budget for our event was zero dollars. So we had to come up with a way to do this for free. And so we managed to track down this platform called B.Live. And we wanted to, the, the whole dance to still feel exactly the same. So and in our live event, we get our legislators, they all come out for it to help recognize our award recipients. Um, we, you know, our award recipients are all there on site. 
Um, so we, in addition, you know, board members and our foundation board and everybody. And what we decided, what we found was this platform that allowed you to have live elements, but also videos. And we worked really, really diligently for in the weeks leading up to this to get videos from everyone. And we got videos from everyone. All of our legislators sent in videos of support. Um, you know, we, we worked with our houses to come up with creative videos to you know, recognize our, what would have been a table sponsor at the dinner dance, we made them a community supporter. And we had a video where I went to all of our IRAs and I had our individuals open up their logos with a thank you message on it and say thank you. And you know, we did all of our award videos. They ended up getting those put together. We have an excellent ad agency that we actually, um, they are recognized as a platinum partner because we do a trade with them for these videos every year. Um, and so they were able to take all this footage and cobble all these videos together for these really awesome award videos of just the same caliber as our in-person video from 2019 were, where we were able to bring people on site and have them interviewed. And like, they, these were still just as high quality and just as good. And in addition, we had dance videos. So we came up with a selection of basically like popular karaoke songs that we put out to our staff and we had dance videos. We had our IRAs, they participated by sending us these dance videos of them doing dance, picking a song and dancing to it. And they were, they came the out- The cutest really things. Yeah, they were, they were a lot of fun and there was a lot of energy. And so we worked with our local barbecue joint, Food and Fire, um, to he, the, the owner, Dan, he is a big supporter of our organization and he emceed. So I was on site with him and Sherry was at our Cutler Pond location with our executive assistant at the time. And they were cutting back and forth using this platform and then also showing the videos. And so throughout the course of the evening, we had over a thousand people tune in and watch this live broadcast, which ended up being about 90 minutes. Um, as you can see, the net revenue on that was $10,000, or that was our goal. And we ended up getting 33,000. And um, the other cool thing that we did with this that, was all, that helped kind of drive fundraising was we worked with Dan at Food and Fire to come up with a special achieve meal for that night. So we had these box meals that went out that everybody was able to buy to help kind of sit, show support. It was like a wango tango sauce or something like that on their uh, barbecue chicken. So that event ended up being really successful. So then we're, that event ends and it's becoming clear again that we're not gonna be able to have Savor the Summer virus isn't going anywhere, people can't, we still aren't able to even just by um, mandate have, you know, congregate events. So we worked with M&T Bank, who we again had secured as our, our presenting sponsor for this event. And we came up with this idea of what if we did like a give back fundraiser? So not savor the summer, share the summer. We've been, in 2019, it had been the 10th year of savor the summer. And we'd had some of those vendors, some of those restaurants, some of those wineries, they had been there for all 10 years and showed support. And as we all can remember, back in August of last year, restaurants were really hurting. I mean, they, were, they weren't doing great. So the idea was, well, let's drive business to them. Let's drive business to those restaurants that have supported us, to those wineries, to those breweries that have shown us so much support over the years as our way of showing appreciation for them. And so we sold what we called passports to delicious destinations. And I got through it the first time. <laughs> um, and what they were was kind of just like coupon books, like your save around books. They, they offered, you know, free beverage with a burger purchase, you know. Um, but again, the idea being, let's drive business back to them to say thank you to them. And we, I mean, we did this all right. We, we worked with M&T. We held a press conference. We got the president of a local organization of, or like a local coalition of restaurants, local restaurants called Southern Tier Independent Restaurants. Um, he came, he came out to the, the press conference to help promote it. We had our county executive come and help promote it um, at this press conference. Like we, the president of M&T Bank came and helped us promote it. So this really was a way of us driving business back. So our goal for that and again, these goals were all set before and when, I, when we were crafting the budget pre-COVID. Um, and our goal was 45,000, our actual was 53,710. Um, and again, that, some of that goal is some of those, those do dollars from the bowling tournament that we ended up rolling over. And what we did with the bowling tournament was we ended, we ended up having, we still ended up having a silent, not a silent auction, but raffles. We still ended up, you know, having, um, getting some items donated for like big picture baskets that we were able to raffle off. Um, and when, then we had a grand prize basket, and that was what we rolled our bowling sponsors into. 
And then our last one was the half K. Um, and this was uh, the one that was probably the easiest. So what I will say, and by that, I mean like to transition this to a virtual. When COVID hit the community, I, if I had an email come across that had anything to do with transitioning or virtual events, I attended it. Like I, I was there, I was, I was doing my research, I was making sure. And these were the ones that everybody always has said, you know, walks, runs, 5Ks, whatever, they can all be transitioned fairly easily. Um, so we, we, what we did was we, again, still worked with the Northeast Classic Car Museum. Um, we actually secured NBT Bank as our presenting sponsor um, for this event uh, this year. And we worked with the Classic Car Museum. We still treated this exactly the same as we did the previous year with as an actual like walk. And we had the bibs, we had the sticker, we had, you know, we had cinch bags. Um, and you got a ticket to the Classic Car Museum so that you could go on your own. But what we promoted it as is from the week of the 24th to the 31st, if you were out doing going for your walk or doing your 0.6 run, or even if you just happen to be in a classic car, snap a picture and send it to us. And you'll be featured in our, and this one I could never get through, Facebook finish line photo album. And what we did was we took our, fit, our photo or our finish line sponsors and we made a special border that we would put around these pictures that highlighted our um, finish line sponsors that we'd secured in the lead up to this. This was the event that we also were, it, we had worked with um, an, a, a platform called GiveButter. Our donor management software is Bloomerang. Bloomerang doesn't have any peer to peer capabilities, but they recommended that they incorporate with this GiveButter platform. So we were able to incorporate our peer-to-peer -peer fundraising element to this really successfully. Um, and for if you're not initiated, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is kind of what American Cancer Society does, where you join an event and then you get people to basically sponsor you or to you know support you as you're in this event. So last year I put it out there that for every my hundred dollars I raised, I would run a mile. And my I guess you can my friends, quote unquote, I guess. Uh, through them, I raised over $500. And so a brisk fall day during that week, I had to run five miles. Um, so, and, but it worked. It was a model that worked. And as you can see from you know, what we actually net on that, uh, that event, um, we also were able to incorporate a, a Halloween element in the lead up to Halloween. So go out and do it in the costume. Um, our vice president of programs really helped promote this as an opportunity for some mobility amongst our individuals because they've some of them had been cramped or cooped up in houses for months and we were starting to notice some mobility problems. Um, so get them out. Get, this was an opportunity for them to, to participate in the event, but also you know get active, get out and get active. So we were able to get some promotion for it that way and get some buy-in for it that way. So overall, what did 2020 look at like? Well, we had a net goal of 85,000 and we ended up at 105,000 actual dollars. So we were $20,581 over our goal. And you might remember 2019, that was $8,000 over goal. So we 250% more dollars raised and that was in COVID. And we think that some of the ways that we accomplished this was clear communication. Um, as soon as we knew we were pivoting, as soon as we knew what we were doing, we were in touch with all of our sponsors. Uh, we clear communication right across the board. We were transparent, but we made sure that they knew we have a plan. We are covered. We are doing this. Here's where your dollars are going. Um, as Sherry mentioned, we didn't lose a single platinum partner in 2020. Uh, we had creative ideas. So we worked with our sponsors. Like I said, m and Bank, we actively worked with them to come up with that idea for Share the Summer. We got them involved and that helps them be engaged and that helped them you know, want to take a sense of ownership over this. So we had creative ideas and that creativity helped spawn excitement, helped spawn you know, just getting those donor dollars and maintaining and hanging on to those donor dollars. Um, we also worked with our staff and had individual input and involvement because at the end of the day, these events are also for them and we want them to be able to participate. We want them to be a part of this. And in 20, and in that year, I mean, newness of virtual events, there, it generated excitement. Um, that isn't to say it was easy. There was a lot of learning curves. There was a huge learning curve with each of them. Um, you know, that platform that I mentioned for our dinner dance, Be Live, it's, it's a, it takes time. It's a, it's a hard platform to really kind of master. You don't just sit down and do it. It's, you got to like work with it. Um, you know, we had to really chase, we had to have our Excel sheet of who do we need videos from and, you know, go through and cross those off and, you know, it, there was a lot that went into it. And so there were massive learning curves, but 
it's still there was a gen, there was an excitement and that excitement was felt especially as like we were cooped up longer and longer and people wanted to see what we were up to so then fundraising in 2021 we as we went into our sponsor solicitation in at the end of 2020 and early 2021 we went in prepared and hopeful and optimistic, but we didn't over promise that we didn't under because we didn't want to under deliver for our sponsors. So we went in and we told them, we there's a very realistic chance that we're going to do this in person. We have to be realistic, though, at the same time and recognize that COVID is still very much a thing. But hey, vaccines, this could all this could change everything. Um, and so we we went right up to them, we were right up front with them and said, Either we're going, we have these plans in place. If we have to go virtual, here's what you're getting for your do donor dollars. If you are for live, here's what you're getting for your donor dollars. And so our first fundraiser again is our bowling tournament. And so we made the decision probably late January, early February as, wa as we were watching things that this probably wasn't gonna be able to be held in person. So we worked with our bowling alley and we came up with this idea um, to do a, the Bob Warner pin crushing classic, not tournament, but the bowl -a and so we, from March 27th through August 31st, if you bought a ticket, which included three games of bowling, bowling shoes, pizza, um, slice of, or yeah, slice of pizza, a soda, um, bumper cars, and an entry into the laser tag arena, um, you know, all for the same price of what your our normal ticket was, um, you could go anytime between those dates and redeem it. And so it was a virtual bowling tournament. And then it ended up not being a tournament because the bowling alley, who were being super generous in that package, uh, just said they it, it would just be too complicated to try and track that over a five month period. And we were like, you know what? Yes, that's fine. We get it. Um, you know, that's you're already helping us out quite a bit. Um, and so what we would do is we would go to we, you know, if our houses bought tickets or one of our sponsors notified us they had a team going out to bowl, we would go out and get pictures. And we would just and get pictures of the bowling tournament during that time, during that time frame. Um, we worked with uh, with Bob Warner and Assemblyman Angelino. We went to, we had 15 of our IRAs participate. Over the course of two days, we visited those IRAs and they presented the medals just like they would do at the bowling tournament. Um, we, we wanted to make this, we basically brought the tournament to you. Um, that was a net revenue goal of 22,000. We were just shy of that. I joked with Sherry yesterday, if I win the lottery by the end of the year, I'm going to donate $81 to get us to that goal. Um, but it, it's still like for a virtual bowling tournament, it, it ended up coming out really well. So then after that, we had our a dinner dance coming up and it was still clear that, you know, the logistics of doing it in person were not going to be in our favor. Um, even just with the sponsors and the seats, the capacity for the venue that we use for that tournament wouldn't have been able to accommodate just the you know, sponsors that we'd already solicited or, or that we'd already secured. Um, we wouldn't have been able to accommodate those tickets. So uh, we ended up going back to a virtual dance party this year and we made it hybrid. That was the one thing we were able to do differently. Restaurants were open. So we worked with Food and Fire again. Dan hosted alongside our CEO, Amy. Um, we were able to invite some of our sponsors to join us at the restaurant. Um, we invited our board of directors, including, and we were able to have our board president, you know, speak. And we had another, um, one of our self-advocates who's on our board. Uh, he spoke and, and worked with, to help promote membership. Um, and we, you know, did the same thing. We did it, we recorded it. We, you know, the video of it can be found on our website um, under our events section. Um, but it, it ended up going off really well. We still were able to, you know, get the videos for the awards. Um, we were able to do those though. Again, we were able to have people come on site because of vaccinations and everything. So it ended up being a much more hybrid event that we were able to, you know, really get people involved. And we had some of our sponsors join us, you know, and they stuck around afterwards. They didn't just like end the broadcast and leave. They stuck around We and we, you know, sat with them. We were able to meet with them for the first time in, you know, 15 months. It was really nice. So then savor the summer. By this point, you know, numbers were really low uh, in our community. Um, you know, people were having in-person fundraisers. Things were looking really, really good, but we said, okay, well, let's bump this out a week or a month. Um, we usually traditionally, when we hold this in August, we're threading the needle between um, the, Dick's Sporting Goods good, uh, the Dick's Sporting Goods Open, which happens uh, in Broome County, and then the State Fair. So we usually are threading the needle right between that. We said, let's bump this out a month. 
Let's give a little bit more time to keep promoting vaccination efforts, get those numbers down, get people comfortable doing a, an in-person event. Um, and we touted it in all the lead up to, those, to that date. We touted it as, you know, we're really excited. This is our first in-person event in 18 months. Like, please join us. You know, everybody that was on board was really excited. And then, you know, as we all know, in September, numbers started going back up again, Delta hit, and the numbers just started skyrocketing. So one week before the 24th, we canceled and we, uh, we were heartbroken. I mean, that's, that's the only word to use for it. We really were heartbroken. We were disappointed. Um, we just were so confident this was gonna be our first event back. And so we still managed though to, you know, we had all but one sponsor defer their sponsorship to the half K. We still, at the end of that, had a net revenue of 42.6 out of a $45,000 goal. So a little under goal. If we'd had that event in person though, with the silent auction, with the ticket sales, with all of that, easily, it's very confident we would have exceeded that goal. It just, because we had to cancel, it just, it wasn't able to happen. And now we are in the midst or on the cusp of our second virtual half K classic. This was a decision to go virtual that was kind of taken out of our hands. The Northeast Classic Car Museum, which is a pretty central element to this event, they called us uh, end of September and we're like, we haven't had a in-person event here. You know, museums open, but we haven't had any events here since February of 2020. Um, Norwich is a small community. We really don't want to take the risk of, you know, being seen as like a, a an unhealthy organization if, you know, we you guys have your event, it turns into like a super spreader event. And so they politely declined hosting. We figured, you know, we already have the infrastructure in place. There's really nowhere else to kind of route this, this 0.6 miles to in Norwich to, to have the event. So we, we just transitioned it. Um, so we have a goal of 12,000. To date, we're at 14,000 and uh, change on that. That will launch on Saturday. We're still doing the peer-to-peer. Um, we're trying to promote it within our organization to, to you know, get people, get our individuals signed up to get staff to participate and help drive that kind of promotion as well. Um, and so we'll see that number again as an actual number to date. There's, uh, there's a couple expenses in there that haven't been factored in, but we're still well over goal and will be over goal for that event. So pivoting in 2021. Um, so our net revenue goal was 89,000. To date, we're at 99. So we're over goal, but compared to last year when we were at 20,000, over $20,000, it's still a huge chunk of change that's missing. Some of the successes that we found with this year and you know, vaccinations really helped, um, but internal agency reopening and outings, kind of the restrictions on those easing up, that certainly helped. Um, it gave the opportunity to go to the bowling tournament for, uh, for our houses to get out and to go you know, do bowling or to you know, just, participate again. Um, for you know the dinner dance and the half K, the infrastructure was in place to pivot. So we could do it easily. Um, and so that that also really helped. Again, the communication and the planning up front. So during that sponsor solicitation saying you got an either or here scenario, it made it a lot easier to communicate with them and just be like, hey, as a reminder with this event, this is what we were going to do. And you know, we we all but lost one sponsor this year for Save of the Summer. We retained all of our platinum partners. And virtual events are minimal expenses. Um, so that helps drive that number up, obviously, because if we're not renting a venue, if we're not paying for dinners, um, the, our most expensive event is, is our dinner dance because of just all those overhead costs. But that helps lead to, you know, our, with those lack of tickets and things like that, it still helps us to, to hit our goals. Challenges though, this year was a lot more challenging um, in a lot of ways. And I think the biggest one is virtual event fatigue. People are just tired of hearing about virtual events. They wanna be back together. Um, prior to you know, this starting, we were talking you know, about how people just wanna be back together. They're just tired of virtual events. They just aren't feeling them anymore. Um, and that, that's definitely being felt. Um, changing public health rules, this was a big challenge. This made it, it, it's hard to shoot at a moving target. And so we didn't, you know, if the rules are changing every week, it made it a lot harder for us to make decisions. Uh, should we go virtual or not? I, I can speak for, I'll speak for Sherry and say, I know that she agonized over like in planning, because why am I planning for a live event if we're going to have to just pivot it virtually? And, and it's, a, it's valid and it's, it's exhausting trying to kind of figure that out and to navigate those, those public health rules as they, you know, things changed, as Delta became, you know, more and more of an issue. 
And another big one um, that may not be like right there on the surface is staffing shortages. Um, I'm sure it's no secret to everybody that our industry is facing a staffing crisis and that makes it difficult. It's hard to encourage people to go out and participate in a bowling tournament when they, if only one half of the house wants to participate and they don't have enough staff to get people to the bowling alley. Um, so staffing shortages are, were, have been a problem. It's, but in, in addition to that, those staffing shortages are also, there's burnout. And that burnout, I think, has led to a, a lack of enthusiasm. So, and that was evident even in trying to get like our dance videos. It was, we had over, we over anticipated how many people were gonna to wanna to participate again in the dance videos. And so we only had a couple come in this year rather than I think we had six or seven last year. We had, I think we had three this year. There's just that, that lack of enthusiasm. And I think that's both just because of the staffing shortage. It's just hard to promote something when you just know that it's gonna be really hard for you yourself to get involved. So that's talking about how that's talking about our events and how we pivoted and how we changed transition. Um, but the other thing that, as you saw with our platinum partners, we have gone up every year. So, and some of those are new prospects. So how do we get those prospects? And this is probably what people are going to be more interested in. So start with your board of directors. And I mean, this as like a, a collective unit. Um, our board of directors is a platinum partner and I'm not necessarily saying you need them to sponsor an event. Um, because that may not be what it is, but use your board of directors. You know, if you have a silent auction, ask them all to participate by getting you something for that silent auction so that you can, you know, more resources um, and then make them a sponsor of the silent auction. If you, there's, there's other ways to creatively get your board of directors as a unit involved. It doesn't have to be, you know, making them sponsor an event, and, you know, but, but have them get involved directly. Just remember, it's, sometimes it's hard to remember that they're aligned with your organization and they want to help all of them. They all are on board. They're not just a voting body. Like they want to help. They want to be involved. That's why they're on your board. So make sure that you're, you're utilizing them. Um, and then one second, your board members individually, who do they know? What businesses are they affiliated with? What organizations are they affiliated with? How can they help you? How, who do they know that they can, you know, make that virtual handshake with in this, this time? Um, but who, ask, who do they know? That's, that's just like a really, it's, it's, they, they, they want to help again. So who do they know that they, you can identify as a new prospect that they can just not make the ask for you, but just introduce you to? Um, track similar nonprofits in your area. Um, if you are the development person who manages social media, I hope you're following all of the similar nonprofits because they are also having fundraisers. Who's, who's sponsoring those fundraisers? Because if they're aligned with an organization that's similar to yours, well, then chances are that they're familiar with you as well, and you can reach out to them. And then the hardest part of that is just figuring out who you need to talk to. Um, and that's really not that hard. It's always just, you know, cold calling is not fun, but it's, it, they, they're already going to be semi-familiar with you, or at least the population that you support. Vendors, this, who is getting your money? Who are you paying? Um, because they're gonna already be familiar with you as well. And Sherry had a great, this great idea. She went to our finance department and had them run a list of everybody in 2020 that we paid over $5,000 to. And we combed that list and we pulled, and we started pulling out, oh, okay, here's this. Yeah, we should be reaching out to this person. We should be reaching out to this person. Oh, this person gets like $15,000. This company gets $15,000 from us every year. They could easily get, you know, we come on as a platinum partner. And then the hardest part of that was just, if it was an IT company, we would work with our director of IT to see who they work with. And, and again, just using, you know, using the people that they, that might be affiliated with these companies to try and tr track down um, some new sponsors. And then lastly, utilizing network, networking organizations. So, you know, your chamber of commerce, are you going to those events? Are you just your traditional networking organizations? There, you're, there's a lot to be gleaned from those and even just reading their newsletters. Um, but, and like Sherry joined BNI, a business group, so that she could identify some new prospective sponsors. Um, so these are just some, a couple ways to identify some potential prospects. So some of the key takeaways from 2020 and 2021, and really just fundraising in general, um, communicate, communicate, communicate. I, I have no doubt that we would not have been as successful in, our, in transitioning everything virtually if we didn't communicate with our sponsors right up front. Within 24 hours, Sherry, of having our plan in place, all of our sponsors knew what we were doing. Um, that 
was every single event, all at this point, all eight of them, crazily enough, um, communicate. That is key. Transparency is key. I, I have no doubt that that communication and that transparency is the reason that we have been able to maintain all of our sponsors, minus you know one or two um, over the last two years. But we haven't lost a single platinum partner. Language matters. So I hope it goes without saying, but what I mean by this isn't that you should have a profan you should send profanity laden emails to your sponsors. I don't think that's going to work out for you. Um, but your language matters. So for instance, there's a big difference between saying thank you for the support and thank you for your support. I always say thank you for your support, regardless of who I'm talking to, whether it's you know the Peter Newman's presidents of MT Bank of the world or the person that's just going to take our packet of information and send it on. That person that's sending the information on, they're still supporting you. They're still the gatekeeper for you getting that information into the hands of the people that are going to make the decisions. It's so thank you for your support. It gives them buy-in. It helps them buy in. So language is really important. As Sherry mentioned, we call it our platinum partner family. It's a relationship. We want to make sure that you're driving a relationship. Um, the other thing that I'll just say with that is just with with our communication, Sherry and I always issued, if we were sending emails out, we made sure we worked together to make sure that the emails that were going out were the same. Our community is, you know, our business community, They people talk to each other. We want to make sure that if they're both talking about our event, they're getting the same information. So we would both send the same emails if we were communicating that way. Um, but the other thing is with regards to language, if the first thing you're putting out there for an event is that you're willing to offer them a refund, that's the first thing they're going to hear. But if you say, you know, we have a plan in place, this is what we want to do with your dollars, this is, you know, what, what the direction we're taking with this, that's what they're going to hear. And so that I think helped as well. The other thing with language is don't ask, invite. Um, this is a lot of times we can talk to, you know, people in this in development and fundraising. They'll say their biggest anxiety is, you know, how to do the ask. I don't know how to do the ask. Well, then don't invite them. I, you know, we'd love to bring you on as one of our newest platinum partners in 2021. Um, we'd love to give you a tour and, you know, talk more about some of the stuff that's going on at our organization, including some of our fundraisers. There's not really an ask in there. It's just an invitation for them to, to come on board. Um, and that, I mean, that works in, in a lot of different ways, not just with regards to fundraising, but, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's just ways if you invite people, it doesn't have to be a difficult ask. And it's actually, I think, a lot more, a lot warmer to, to bring people in. It helps that to establish that relationship. Do your research. This isn't just on like, this is, this is both with your regards to your sponsors, but again, we pulled that finance list, do research. It really goes a long way. You want to make sure you're doing the appropriate ask, not going to the, to somebody that can definitely not do more than a thousand dollars and come giving them a $3,000 pitch. Um, so doing your research on that regard is really important, but just doing your research on, you know, like I said, monitoring other organizations, social media, to see who's sponsoring those, um, things like that. Just doing research can go a long way towards helping you identify prospective fundraisers or prospective uh, donors. As Sherry mentioned earlier, start asking early. Um, if you're asking, if you have an event in September and you're asking in September for sponsors, their dollars have probably already been used up. So we, as soon as our half K wraps up, we'll start putting together our fundraising plan for 2022. And we'll start doing our outreach and start getting you know, meetings virtually or other setup. Um, and we'll, so we'll start that. And, you know, we've usually have most of our sponsors procured by or secured, you know, by early February. Use your weapons, not literally. Don't show up to a sponsor meeting with a gun. It's not going to work out well for you. But what I mean by this is use your resources, you know, use your CEO, use your board members, use the people that can help you. If it's an IT company you want, use your IT director, you know, use those. But the thing that we found is you have to help them help you. So with our board members, we were, you know, we were looking for sponsors. Well, that's great. But like, they don't know who we've reached out to. They don't know who we've secured. They don't know who's who we want. So we put together a list of exactly that. Here's who we've secured. Here's who we are in prospect with or are in process with. And here's who we want. Here's this list of people that we want. Can you help us? Can you help us get in the door with this? And that has helped. That has been the way to get that into those introductions, to get those virtual handshakes, to get donor dollars, and to you know open up those relationships. Um, so use your weapons. Use the people around you that can help you and help you get in the door. Engage key stakeholders at every stage. This really kind of goes back to communication. Just make sure that you're communicating. Make sure that they're engaged. Make sure that you're getting their input. That they 
understand what's going on, that they're on board with it. Um, so make sure you're engaging them at every stage. Make sure you're giving them regular updates as to what's going on. Get creative in identifying and recognizing sponsors. So for instance, we do ad trades for our for Savor the Summer. Um, we don't pay for media for that. We just do media buy, media trades for that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you, know, you could use your board of directors, make them a silent auction sponsor by just having them give you resources. But just get creative. Um, you know, there, there certainly are bad ideas in fundraising, but there's not always, but there's also a lot of opportunity, especially in this new virtual world, to really find creative ways to keep your events going, to keep your sponsors happy, um, to recognize them, making sure that you're, you are doing that, um, and just having a plan. And lastly, minimize burnout. Don't go at it alone. And again, this really ties into, you know, your key stakeholders, using your weapons, um, communicating, but don't go at it alone. I, I know that, like, that this would have been a very, very frustrating last two years if I didn't have Sherry to lean on, or if I didn't have you know, our CEO, Amy, to help us out, or you know, other people to just really do it. Fundraising at the end of the day is kind of sometimes feels like a, a no game, where you're always gonna hear no, or you're, you, know, you might have a couple of days, where you're just getting declined. And that can get frustrating, and that can burn you out. So make sure you don't go at it alone. Um, make sure you have, you're using the people around you that can really help you out. Because um, that goes a long way towards just really remaining engaged. And if you're engaged, that helps you get creative. Um, it really all just kind of ties together. And with that, that kind of wraps it up. Here's all of our information again. Um, I certainly am more than willing to, if you want to reach out to me ever for with questions, I'm gladly talk with you about some of that stuff. I'm sure I speak with for Sherry when she, she says that she would gladly, you know, take questions um, or, you know, help you with help you out absolutely so i don't know did any questions come in i did not see any um susan brandt raised her hand so sue if you want to just unmute yourself that would be great sure i first of all i want to thank you for such a great presentation i really learned a lot and it actually made me a little excited about um, fundraising in general. But I do have a, a quick question. With your events, I think one of the things that struck me was that you didn't just do a virtual event and forget all of the things that usually come with a live event, such as the, um, the bowling tickets, the racing bibs, the cinch bags. Um, that really made the event real, I think. Um, and I was just wondering how you handled the, the logistics of getting all of those things to the people who um, were involved. Sherry, I'll let you take that. Yeah, so um, when the tickets come in, I mean, it, it definitely um, is a little harder, but we would, um, for the house that like a lot of the participation for our individuals was just packaged up and delivered to the houses for people in the community um most generally they were mailed although they were given an option to come pick it up but like we tried to keep them small like the so they didn't the cost wasn't too prohibitive like the cinch bags and all all everything that went into the package last year for um uh, the half K for instance, fit into like a nine by five envelope. Um, and like I said, they had an option of coming and picking it up, um, but most generally we just mailed them out. And to Sherry's point, like, yeah, we we, tr we did that deliberately. We tried to do that by design to you know make sure that we could, it was something that we could either deliver or get mailed in short order. Thank you. I just have one extra question, if I could. Um, I know that you know many of our chapters, now that we're becoming larger chapters, multiple county chapters, um, how do you, do, do, do your events, do you spread your events around your tri-counties that you uh, your chapter is comprised of? Are they, is there a hub that you usually use for the live events? Um, how does that work and how do you engage your your, the, all of the counties of your chapter. So our first three of uh, the first three events of the year, our bowling tournament, our dinner dance, and our um, savor the summer tasting event. Those are all located in Broome County. And the way that our three counties are kind of set up is you've got one kind of to the west, and you've got one kind of to the northeast. And so that kind of it kind of works well. It's not it's about an hour um, to Norwich, where our Shenango Day Hab is, and our, our residences are up there. Um, 
so and then our fourth event was the one that we did up there by design um, that one was primarily attended by people from the Norwich community, but we did have a couple participants from Broome County. Um, and it's just, the, it, it, we do, we, with the first three events that are in Broome, it's because it's only an hour, it really wasn't, it's not too, too prohibitive for anybody to come if they want to attend. Um, so we still, still do get a good amount of participation from our Norwich um, residents and participants. Okay, I don't see any further questions in the chat box and I do not see any other hands raised. So if anybody has a question, please feel free to unmute yourself. I have a question for Preston. It's Faith from the Arcot Seago. When you did oh, um, Savor the Summer, the restaurants that participate, uh, did they donate their set up in food and all of that uh was that part of their sponsorship how did that all work yes it's all they they donate it um we we help them out with things like ice um but add the the food and everything and actually we work with them if they want to participate but they just don't have the manpower we even get volunteers for that um that's our event that when we put out the call for volunteers it's pretty much booked up immediately our staff are very very much excited to participate in that event but yeah awesome thank the, you it's the, a the restaurants they donate everything we had the idea um, just because we knew that restaurants were kind of struggling when we were planning this year of maybe trying to figure out a way to help them with costs, um, you know, maybe even maybe approaching our foundation board to see if they would be willing to kind of provide like scholarships, not scholarships, but like um, mini grants just to help with the cost of supplies. Um, but we, we were able to get before we had to cancel, we've still had over 20 people, 20 restaurants signed up as it was. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Preston. I would just like to add that because um, I do most of the vendor solicitation and a lot of them are surprised that we don't charge them as part of our fundraiser to attend our fundraiser. Um, I think that's why, you know, it's a very elegant event. We, we take care of everything for them and we don't charge them. We, and again, to the invite, we invite them to come. And once they're here, they're hooked because it's just a beautiful event. They don't have to pay anything. They get themselves in front of all of our sponsors, which is what they, which is our goal. You know, we'll help you showcase, you help us with our fundraiser. It's really, it's my favorite event probably I had to pick. Awesome. Thank you both so much. You're welcome. Anyone else? Sue, would you like to close the session? Sure. So uh, I, again, I want to thank uh, both of you for such a wonderful presentation. This was really interesting. It was the first of our um, annual meeting educational session. So this worked out, you know, it was just a great session to kick it off. This will, this has been recorded and it will be, um, it will, we'll be placing it in the website in the annual meeting schedule as we uh, download these um, recordings so that you can go back and, and see them. Again, thank you so much. You did an awesome job. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hope everybody found it you know, engaging and it was a pleasure. Thank you, President Jari. Thank you so much. And thanks thank everyone you. for attending. Thanks. Have a great day.